Hi guys. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us. A little different tonight. We're going to cover with a little bit more detail what it is that we do. As our access grows, we get a lot more questions and a lot of them are great. What it tells me is that either we're hiding it or we're not describing properly a lot of the nuance of, of the value of, of what we offer. There's a bunch of tips to the spear. Of course, the primary thing we offer is training in person here in Rochester, New York. We travel and train people. We enjoy that a lot. People come and visit us from all over the place. We love that too. But there's a lot more to it than that. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to do is read first the manifestos for each of the primary spears. Our main program, the Public Assistance Project, and then our newer remote development resource. <clears throat> we'll discuss them after reading them. If you guys have questions, please ask. But there's plenty to cover here, and, and this will be a lot for reference also. Important tonight, but also important to refer to. Most of the things that I'll say tonight have been either said or read somewhere else. But this will be a nice little collection, and, and hopefully if any of you have people that were curious, a lot of you have been probably curious yourselves. Some of you that are already on here I've seen have interacted with us, and we've met a lot of you, and hello. But hopefully this will, this will at least... Uh, deepen the thought process and, and give you guys some, I don't know, a different platform to maybe share with, with people that may be curious or may wonder what you're up to if, if you're aligning with us or, or practicing some of our process. <clears throat> in regards to our main project, Wolf Brigade began in 2008. My training career began long before that. And we've been big on articulating what we try and offer that's different. Sometimes the details of that articulation get lost in the shuffle because people don't like to read or think and their patients aren't really their strong suit. For those, this may not be for you, but for those that like detail and understand that detail equals progress, you will probably have good luck with what we're doing for as long as you choose to do it. First, Wolf Brigade as a whole, our purpose is the constant construction, refinement, and transmission of hard, simple, and infinitely versatile paths geared to help people think, act, and adapt in lasting and non-disposable ways. We prove the process most profoundly on ourselves, those in our immediate midst, and alongside our attentive and progress-minded agents around the world. We don't sit fences, we don't make excuses. We share what we know and hunt what we don't. We don't subscribe to any tradition or notion not mirrored by a measurable, progressive function. And we challenge any that are simply based on convention. Believe only what is told and shown by those that have truly learned and grown. It doesn't have to be us, but make them earn your trust. Process minus proof is a half empty glass. In a big picture scheme of things, what we've always aspired to do and what I believe we've done successfully and will continue to improve forever is building phenomenal generalists. We do things heavy, we do things fast, we do things hard. There's always some level of calibration to it. And I think the largest nuance of what we do differently is accessorizing the primary patterns, barbells, and energy systems with kettlebells and maces. As soon as we started realizing how many corners you could light and how many stones you could turn over by taking the stuff that most people had done before and done extremely well and adding some details that no one had yet addressed, 
man, it starts really building something special. And we've seen that in, in, in so many people. A lot of times on here, we've shared some of those stories and, and we're happy to repeat any of those that anyone finds interesting. There's a lot of proof that we don't bark about too loud because, you know, it, it, this self-aggrandizing type stuff is, is not really, it's not really our purpose, but in a way, it's limited us that we haven't shared some of the insane developments that, that we've helped cultivate and, and that we've helped bring into place. So anytime any of that stuff is interesting, just please let us know. All of this thing is, um, it's a living document. And, and if we don't get input and feedback and constructive criticism, uh, it doesn't get as good as it can possibly be. And we get, a, we get a lot of it. And on the constructive criticism side, there's been a lot of hilarious stuff lately. Um, but we also do get some positive constructive criticism. If you do have questions, we can bring them through anytime. The first thing I read was our overview of Wolf Brigade in general. What I'm gonna read next is the Public Assistance Project Manifesto. This is something that we shared a few years ago. We've always been extremely keen to make sure that anyone can do anything they need to do anywhere with everything or nothing. We've always believed that that's extremely important. We love having a well-appointed gym, but if we don't, we don't. And a lot of times we don't. A lot of us travel, a lot of us go do different stuff, and, and the gym is a means to an end for a lot of things. And what that means is you can't count on it all the time in order to get done what you need to get done. The Public Assistance Project was a way to reach a lot of people remotely that we would never see in person but that had expressed gigantic interest in what we do in, in being a part of our process. So this is, this is what we came up with. As a continuation of our process of excuse extermination, we give you the Wolf Brigade Public Assistance Project. Predicated on our experience that simplicity does not need to separate from specificity and that when properly aligned, the two can make anyone on earth a stronger and more capable version of themselves. This platform will give any and all with the want and will access to pieces of our process. Outdoors, indoors, rain, sand, snow. Needed to complete the assignments are simply strong handled gallon jugs filled with whatever you choose. Resourcefulness a non-modern attention span, and a desire to improve both physical condition and mental constitution. Conventional tools, kettlebells, dumbbells may be used for this training, of course, but the point is they don't have to be. Now, anyone in the entire world with access to a gallon jug and the understanding that nothing is nothing can be a part of this foundational fold of the Wolf Brigade process. Think of it as a gateway drug that is both safe and positive to become addicted to. Not to be lost in the shuffle and no small consideration in its concept and execution is the ability this gives us to help you coordinate with other dissenters, progressivists in your area, along your travel routes, or at out-of-town destinations. The value of such convergences and congregations cannot be overstated, and we strongly encourage you to take ownership of this process and locate accomplices. There's value to meeting in the rain, in the snow, in the night. There's value to getting your clothes dirty and planning accordingly to integrate with and thrive in any environment. Performance of simple but thorough tasks in a variety of settings, circumstances, and abnormalities is an art form and challenge of its own, and one that most are unwilling to undertake. We caution against being the kind that relegates training to the ideal mo moments, accessories, and climates. If truly driven by what we need, not simply what we fancy, constant comfort is a considerable liability. 
This is not an opportunistic, this perfect single tool that we sell is the be all end all of fitness. It's the opposite of that. Anything this simple will leave holes in the boat, but will patch just as many, and more importantly, give a brand new vessel to many more. It was concepted and constructed for those that are isolated, traveling, new to training, poor, creative, or simply in search of something different but not gimmicky, put forth by a group that would never even once for one minute present anything that they haven't used and proven on themselves and others. Our primary program and the details that build and fill it are among the very best in the world. This, by design, is less involved and a bit less obsessive, but in no way unspecific. Without guidelines, accountability, and standards, you'll never be any stronger than nature made you and your already efforts have kept you. Those that achieve beyond average strength, conditioning, positioning, composure, durability, adaptability, almost always earn it by adhering to hard standards and demanding accountability, often when they would prefer not to. The Public Assistance Project accepts and suggests donations, but considers them a contribution, not a handout. Participation does not require donation, and even if the scales never balance, the short leg will walk on. We expect nothing, yet appreciate everything. At the end of the three-month project, participants will begin the cycle again using more weight, completing in less time, with more violence, better details, less rest, harsher elements, less questions. Standardization must be followed with replication in order to prove improvement. Once is luck. This will spread and has and donations from those that support it will fan the flame. We appreciate help more than most because we give it far more than we receive it. So far, the Public Assistance Project has elicited communication from at least 10 countries, many states, most states, has ushered in a facility, Atlantic Avenue Athletic Club in Toronto. Matt began the public assistance project in the park up there, did such an incredible job, had such great response that it turned into a brick and mortar location that we could not be more proud of. There are a ton of people in California. There are a ton of people down south. There are a ton of people everywhere that are participating in this and enjoying it and communicating about it, uh, both in front of our faces and behind. And the other thing that I think is probably the coolest, at least maybe the thing that I enjoy most, is that when we see them, if we've never met them before or if they integrate into the remote development, they're ready because pattern is pattern, system is system. And if you've built them properly, they transfer to everything else. So people that have started in public assistance, people that have really gone through and dissected the movement library and, and practiced a lot of those details, when we end up seeing them in person to train them, geez, they're ahead of the curve. And I like to think that that's because we demonstrate and articulate things in a really straightforward, accurate way. But none of that makes any difference if people don't practice themselves. So we applaud those that are using the public assistance project as a launch pad for their better training later, different training later, more thorough training later. We've had really successful power lifters use this as a warm up and accessory. That's excellent. I did a bunch of these with anything I could think of up to weights that were way out of my pay grade. And man, if you add some decent weight to that public assistance training, it is really, really challenging. 
and still really simple to complete remotely. All of that's available on our site. All of it's available for free. Matt from Toronto narrated all of it as well. So a lot of that stuff is available everywhere. Some of it is only available on our remote development site. And we're very proud to have finally offered a paid offering after 12 years and, and about 6 million requests. We never liked the idea of, I don't know what they call it, online programs or something. A lot of them that we paid for and or got for free and or read through were, were okay, but very plug and play, too simple to be really valuable and, and no assessment, very little detail orientation that wasn't so broad that there's almost no way it could apply to anyone that doesn't already understand what they're doing. We wanted to make something the opposite of that. So the remote development is the same assessment, very similar assessment to what we would do in person, same detailed responses, and then access to the training that we're currently doing along with a bunch of other supplemental stuff that we've, that we've set up that's a little bit more geared for fighting. Some of it's a little bit more geared for kettlebells. Some of it's geared for maces, but all of it seems up nicely and, and creates both a primary and accessory programs that, that we're proud of. <clears throat> the Subversive Fitness site is, is where the remote development resource lives. Remote in the context used here doesn't mean without things, without others, or in place of something preferable. It simply means not here at our facility. Any athlete or trainer on earth can benefit from our remote development resource and we can prove it. Struggling to optimize and or accessorize a position or pattern for next level development or in getting the less experienced safely and cleanly into them. Need clarity into or deeper understanding of the application of hows, whats, whens, and whys of intelligent, progress-driven training and movement. Looking for someone to prove to you or your clients that plateaus are a myth. Never approached or applied proper mace and or kettlebell training for both strength and conditioning, or as a complement, supplement to a barbell program. We can help, we do help. And now we have created an interactive channel in order to better do so while also deepening the already giant pool of information we provide for free. If you are honestly invested in your craft or in truly helping others improve theirs, something on the list I just read will pique your curiosity. And as always, don't believe us. If you learn nothing, you'll pay nothing. We're not worried about that. Part of the trouble with training people remotely for us, at least conceptually, is you have to see how someone moves. You have to make sure that they're optimizing ranges and positions or realistically, the more they lift, the worse they're gonna move. Simply adding more weight does not always improve position. Sometimes it does because more weight will often force people into positions, but the goal is to have access to the position and then load it and improve it. So if we assess that out of the gate, it's much easier to improve it with some sort of standard and calibration, even from, even from a distance, even remotely. And then what a lot of people are finding in the remote development is that the, accessor the accessory stuff that we do, the mace, kettlebell, complement, supplement, considering that we know how to build every corner on every body, with or without every tool is something that I, I think comes as a surprise to a lot of people. There is no one size fits all when it comes to strength training, especially if people are coming into this thing banged up, especially if people are coming into this thing with either no experience, bad experience. The barbell is not always the perfect tool. The kettlebell is not always the perfect tool. The mace is almost always a perfect accessory tool. But with one of those three tools and then maybe a couple others, 
we can get any person we have ever seen with the willpower to do so into the positions and subsequently into the training days that they need to improve. And part of that is just thinking things out in a little bit different way. Part of it is the fact that I've been really banged up a lot and I've had to adapt a lot. And, and I think that gave me a, a really special kind of fascination with helping those that are doing the same thing. So w- when you start being able to take extreme beginners, no fitness training, uh, possibly like really bad strength, bad midline stability, bad mobility, and building them up and turning them into something that are really standouts, then you know, polishing the diamond, as we mentioned the other day, becomes the easy part. We've taken professional athletes and added really, really important characteristics to their performance. But that's actually really easy once you can do it the other way around. If you can take someone who's got nothing or less than nothing and bring them to a point where they have a lot and they can prove it, they can prove it again. Taking people that already have it is, is, is easy. Proof of progress and proof of participation are different. And that's important. Proof of progress means you can take someone that came in with a very particular skill set or the lack of one and in a relatively linear progression, watch that improve in more than singular arenas. It is also very simple, not easy to bring someone in and improve their deadlift. There are templates for that far greater than anything we could ever come up with. But if that deadlift didn't work right, if there were holes in the boat, either mobility, midline stability, upper body strength, fortitude, constitution, head position, breathing, bracing, any of it, all you're really doing is piling weight onto a bar that you shouldn't be piling on yet because you haven't fully built the foundation Once you've fully built the foundation, or as we say, once you've built the power source, the extension cords, do whatever you want. All three of the programs and projects that we just read focus on that. Thank you for joining us. A lot of the questions tonight really don't have anything to do with what we're doing, and we always appreciate them. We've covered an awful lot of topics on other ones of these, and we'll cover a lot more in the future. We want to stay on a little bit what we're up to, what's different about it, how it may help you, and really just spark interest, or if this isn't for you, and you can listen to this for an hour and, and not find anything interesting that it probably isn't for you. Um, I mean, the, 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 the questions just popped on screen was, was thoughts on self-destructive behavior. Um, everyone does it. We should avoid it as much as we possibly can. Self-destruction is different. Calibrated self-destruction in training is very, very different than self-destruction in life. Once you've built the foundation and earned intensity. Putting yourself on the ground is valuable sometimes, but you can't do it all the time and it should be calibrated. It should be used judiciously. There's, there's, no, there's no purpose in smashing yourself all the time because you're never gonna be recovered enough to get stronger to smash yourself better the next time. One thing that we do well in person and improving every day remotely is insulating everything, not just the stuff that we like the most and not even just the stuff that is the most obvious. There's a bunch of sneaky stuff that when watching people move after watching lots and lots and lots of people move and something that I thought about recently and I was asked the question is, uh, someone, someone phrased it as, do I still teach classes? 
and I, I kind of liked it because it, 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 in a way, it was like assuming that I'm some like fancy ass or something. Uh, I've taught more classes in the last 15 years. I would, I would put, I would put the number against almost anybody as far as quality classes I've taught. And even quantity is, is up there. Uh, we're not a factory farm. We don't have 19 classes a day because you can't teach 19 great classes a day. But I teach a ton of classes and I think it's the most valuable thing that I do because I learn something in every single class that we teach. And the reality is all that stuff goes noticed. It all gets written down. It all gets experimented with. Um, I'm a tinkerer and I think that that benefits a lot of people and certainly benefits me. Even recently, I've, I've self-assessed my way into some progress that I, that I wouldn't necessarily think I would have found otherwise. And in the group and then also remotely, other things we prioritize are, are cultivating an enjoyment of detail. People don't come in with that. But when they start seeing detail translate into things that they really, really enjoy and the reasons that they did come in, then they begin to fall in love with it. The longer they stay there, the more they enjoy it. And the more they apply it, the better they get. An understanding of self-assessment. After the beginner phase of training, which is forever, but at least the first six months when you're a true beginner and still need a lot of guidance, being able to assess yourself is the most valuable tool in your toolbox. At some point, if you don't understand what good and bad movement are, how they look, how they feel, how they're different, you just won't make enough progress to make yourself anything notable. From the beginning, the importance there is paying attention to what you're doing, not simply doing it. And the way that we organize movements, the way that we organize training weeks and things like that, give people the opportunity to do that. They're not these smash down fests that we see all the time. Even recently, some of our people remotely have, have been you know, participating in training, dropping in with friends or, or just training with people in the park or something like that. And, and it's just this senseless attrition based stuff. Um, and the reality is if, is if I can't connect at this point, if I can't connect the dots as to why something is happening, it's probably not the best strategy. By no means am I saying that I know everything, but I do know good and bad training. And I do know what patterns complement, what patterns supplement, which energy systems should get taxed first before you're using something else. All that is really important when it comes to athletic development and not simply just burning someone out. A point that we make often is, Tired is a lot different than better. Tired is easy, better is not. Uh, that's a fragmented question I don't really completely understand. There's a lot of fancy words in there I don't get. Uh, maintaining composure through maybe violent patience. Heavy double kettlebell front rack. Uh, there is no conceding position in a double kettlebell front rack if it's heavy enough to be useful. Bracing before you drop is something we say a lot. Um, just to address the very specific lift mentioned here, double kettlebell front rack, if it comes down here and it's heavy enough to be useful, where's it going next? Down further. We say knuckles up. And the other thing that we've done, we've made adjustments on for a long time is everybody's arm length is a little bit different. It doesn't show as much on the bar because you can see the width, but too narrow is too narrow, too wide is too wide. With the kettlebell, there's a little more nuance to it. Your hands can go anywhere they need to go in order to keep your spine relatively neutral and braced and not let you sag into this position. That requires an intense amount of midline stability and focus. There is no soft breathing during anything in the front rack because it will fold you right forward. You're braced before you drop and you're braced until you stand back up. If you're using enough weight, to actually make yourself stronger, that will self-correct also. Once people have earned that intensity, once people have proven that baseline, understanding a movement, consistent application of it, we expect an illicit effort 
that walks the border of safety and self-destruction. <laughs> self-destruction, not in the sense that you're going to get injured or that you're going to not want to come back. But if you don't feel fatigue, if you don't feel like you want an escape, if you don't feel like you're putting a tax on your body that's very important to notice, you're probably not getting stronger and you're probably not getting as strong as you possibly can. There has to be intensity, there has to be focus, and there has to be purpose. And if those things are present, along with good details, you will improve forever. And occasionally the term safety gets misunderstood when we say it. We've seen a lot of thinking training that's this really paralysis by analysis. You know, the weights are too light to be useful. Uh, there's just this intense focus on one particular kind of position that they just believe is the only position and that is just fucked up and wrong. Uh, there is no perfect position for everybody. Safety means you understand how to keep yourself safe by training strategically and intelligently. It doesn't mean you move so soft and so light and so short that there is no chance or risk of getting hurt. If you expect to be strong and powerful and durable, there is always risk. The risk can be mitigated with intelligence and detail and experience. <clears throat> Thanks for selling Maces Direct. Yeah. Any recommendation on which weight to start with? It's a giant question and a great one that we get all the time. Look, the mace is a devil. If you want an eight kilogram mace to be 300 pounds, you can make it 300 pounds. The mace is phenomenal in the sense that you can make it ridiculously difficult. We tell a lot of strategies about how to do so. For... Um, a standard sized person, 170 pounds, up to maybe 200 pounds, decent mobility, a little bit of strength training. A 10 kilogram mace is probably fine. An eight kilogram mace is also fine. Soon, a 12 kilogram mace will be great for certain things. 14 and 16 will be great for swings, shovels, things like that. If you're just, if you're just starting out, there's no purpose to starting too heavy and, and not enjoying mace training. I think part of the problem with most modern mace training is that there is no how, what, and why, and the weights are whatever is handy. And that's either too heavy or too light is what, is what we've seen. Too light to be useful for an adult is six pounds. You are not going to get stronger with a six pound mace. I'm marginally stronger, locally stronger, but not globally stronger. If taught how to lift it properly, we have never had a single person that could not manage an eight kilogram mace, 18 pounds. Of course, certain things take time to build up to, but we also know how to do that. So great question on the maces. Any weight can serve any purpose. Too heavy is not super sensible to start, that's for sure. And there's so much free mace information on our sites. Uh, none of it is a gimmick. And if you follow, connect the dots, look at the breadcrumbs, do it in order, uh, you will not get hurt. And, and you will quite likely fall in love with the mace as we have. Just like we are not a barbell program, we're not a kettlebell program, we're not a mace program. They all have their independent characteristics. A shoe does not replace your pants. A bird does not replace your dog. They all have their own purposes, and, and when you know how to blend them together, they really turn out something special. Yep, I agree. I agree, Gypsy, and, sh and let's keep showing off, homie. <laughs> Thank you guys for the questions. Something else, we've got about 15 minutes left. If there's an unsung hero, it might be this. Many and most, many slash most, use sit-ups and ab work as fillers, not builders. 
for as many things as a lot of mixed modality programs have brought to the table and improved fitness in general, that's one thing that I really think a lot of people have gotten wrong. You know, 200 flopping your ass to the bar, wiggly motherfucking on the ground, whatever. You're not building midline stability. You're just doing reps for the sake of reps. And with certain things, there's at least a little more sense to it. But with something like midline stability that you really can't risk, you really can't be without. It should be the thing we work the hardest and the most deliberately. We see the opposite of that most times. <clears throat> if I had one broad brush to paint with, I would say that the primary reason many strong people do not perform to their full potential or ability, are not as safe as they could be, as powerful as they could be, as comfortable under heavy loads, and often have trouble moving to a high standard when fatigued or unbelted or off angled is failure to properly build the power source in the same way that there are weightlifting protocols for many, many years that will build a perfect version or a near perfect version of a primary lift. We found the same thing is true with midline stability, lots of holds, controlled flexion extension, a focus on timing and quality, not volume. And our people have the best midline stability of any place I've ever seen. We don't use belts. If people are training for something specific and they need to add one, then great. But that still happens when it's absolutely necessary. When we believe that they are near their structural maxes. If you're using a belt to lift moderate weight, you're under, you're under serving your midline stability in a gigantic way. Build that shit. That's what you need the most when you're thinking about generalism. You're not always going to have a belt and you're not always going to have a bar. You got to pick something really, really heavy up. You got to know how to brace. You got to know that that brace is going to respond when you call it. So the, mid, the midline stability aspect, we believe, combined with the accessories that we use, are probably the two unsung heroes of, of what we do. And they're definitely the reason that... Geez, people have really, really strong and accurate barbell lifts, but we have the heaviest kettlebell and mace lifters in the world, in the world, training in our facility and, and training in our programs. Some days it's, it's kind of hilarious, uh, honestly, because a lot of the people that train with us are relatively new to training. Some of them have more experience than others, but very few have ever done like really deep water strength and conditioning. So on any given day, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how great it is. They don't know how unusual it is. And we really enjoy that. When people come from out of town, that's, that's one of my favorite things is they come in with great skill sets and attitudes and mindsets. And when we start turning the dials a little bit, man, they leave with such great accomplishments. And, and that's one of my favorite things about, about training people that have been paying attention and that really, really give a shit. Uh, but just to need a tiny bit of polishing or need a tiny bit of address uh, a t tiny bit of adjustments, uh, watch, watching them make progress past what they thought was possible in the matter of a day or two is, is, is fascinating and, in my opinion, a really excellent proof of process. So, not a ton of questions tonight. I understand that. Uh, I've talked a lot. It's definitely not my favorite thing to do. I enjoy these things because it lets us reach a lot of people at the same time. Um, but geez, it, sitting here talking in front of the, <laughs> talking in front of the phone to myself, looking at my dumb face is, will never be my favorite thing. Uh, so next time it'll be more interactive and we'll probably talk about a few more fun things. Um, but tonight we really wanted to skin what we do and why, who we try and help, which the answer is everybody and who we can help. And again, the answer is everybody details make the difference. <clears throat> without them, we're not optimizing our money spent. We're not optimizing our time spent. And in this climate, in this culture, especially in this current period, everyone is looking at optimizing everything they're doing because a lot of things have been limited beyond our control right now. We've seen the people that are training with us 
engage in a totally unique way. Even people that have been there a long time have added focus, added fervor, added vigor. You can, you can tell that, that, their, that their light bulb went on, that there really is a bigger picture here and that training is really, really important and should not be taken lightly. It can always be fun, but it can't exclusively be fun or it's not gonna translate to the deepest water that we're ever gonna find. And God, there's some deep water out there right now. The fact that we also train people in a way that does not allow for a lot of the mental vulnerabilities that attrition-based programs allow for is also very important to us. Our volume is moderate, our details are high, our effort is high. People are expected to stay focused. Usually our rest periods are calibrated, either breaths or time or something like that. No one lays on their fucking backs. No one's hands are on their knees when they're in training. Why? Because. Are you done? If you're not, then get up. I've used this before and I'll use it again tonight. If you were going to attack someone, would it be a tired but squared away, standing straight up, looking hard at what's next? Or someone who may not be nearly as tired, maybe even bigger, maybe a little more imposing, with their eyes on the ground and their hands on their knees? That's an easy answer. So we insist that people behave in the training room as if they would be as as if they would outside of the training room. If shit gets hot when you're out of the training room, water gets deep, you're going to put your hands on your knees and look at the ground? Hopefully not. We want to instill the same characteristics in training as we expect outside of training. <clears throat> and we really really appreciate that people actually enjoy that and that it resonates with them. And we see it, we hear stories of it all the time. Even remotely, a lot of the stuff that we've posted has landed. And when we hear someone that we've never met apply something in a deep water situation, that's important. Uh, especially nowadays, outside of training risks are higher than they ever have been. So our need for composure in all circumstances is higher than it ever has been. <clears throat> Lastly, we definitely do not have the platform that, that some have. Quantity-wise, quality-wise, I believe we're far ahead of the curve. <clears throat> We've been plagued with abandonment issues <laughs> from many of the more popular that have moonlighted as our accomplices over the years. That's okay. If they were supposed to be here still, then they would be. If they're not, they're not. Everyone's heard can't beat them, join them. Many don't seem to be fans of that notion with us, partially because I don't think they understand that we're not trying to win at anything but helping people. <laughs> can't beat them, marginalize them. <laughs> Maybe they'll go away. Well, that certainly isn't gonna work. <laughs> side by side said, I'm sure you hate me. I've been hated by the best just because I don't need to fit in with the rest. That is a hard truth for us and always will be. We light all corners. We will grow like weeds. We are the devil in the details that most will choose to never see. Good night.